We've been in this series on Ephesians, and I hope it's helped you. I know it's been, it's been challenging me, for sure. But the re- reality is that, that God wants you to know who you are in Him. We've talked about that for three weeks. The first three weeks, the first three chapters of Ephesians, we declared that you have an identity. How? In Christ. Apart from Him, things are not good. But in Christ, well, as according to week one, we said you're fully pleasing. You're completely forgiven. You're totally accepted, and you're complete in Him. Amen. That's good news. Week two, we said, we declared it. You're His masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works, and that your good works should glorify the master artist. We know who He is, right? Last week, we said that, or the three, week three, we said membership has its privileges. You guys remember that one? Well, we said that because you're a part of the body of Christ, you belong. You belong to a body. You belong to the church. It's a place to belong and have fellowship and and relationship. And we also said it's a place to grow. A place where you can grow in your faith, as we've been talking about. It's a place where you can make a difference. And so that's what we we said in week three. And then last week we said that membership, not only does it have its privileges, but it has its responsibilities. Right? Part of your responsibility as a follower of Jesus, as a part of being in in the body of Christ, you have a a commitment and a responsibility to, to seek unity in the body. It's your job to keep the church united, right? All of us, actually. It's our job. It's also our, our responsibility to help the church grow by growing ourselves and making disciples. It's also our responsibility to cultivate life-giving, healthy relationships within the body. We talked about all that last week. So today we're going to dive into chapter 5 of Ephesians and I want to remind you what Christ's vision for your life is. John 10, 10. We've read this many times, but how many know vision leaks sometimes? We forget. I want to remind you today of who you are and why you're here. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So in Christ, you can have a full life. That's his vision for your life today, you How many of you agree with that? Well, whether you agree or not, it's true, right? So let's dive into Ephesians chapter 5. And before we actually read the passage, I've I've got some questions I want to ask you. Number one, who is your role model? Those are great answers, yes. Can you think of someone else? I mean, that great one. I'm not saying he's not the best one, but. Can you think of someone else, even maybe somebody in a family that you'd like to emulate? Your mom and dad. Good. Very good. What makes them a great role model? What makes mom and dad a great role model? What's, what makes Jesus a great role model? Love. Oh, yeah, man. Great answers. These are awesome answers. And the reason I ask that question is because the, the very first sentence in Ephesians chapter 5, I want you to notice what it says. Let's read it together. What does it say? Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Folks, if that doesn't excite you, that Paul doesn't call, just call you his chi- uh, God's child, what does he say? You're his dear child. There, that's, a, that's a form of affection, right? God loves you so much, and he says, here's how we... Here's how we respond to God's love. We imitate him. Now notice something. What, you know, he answers another question here. What does he say? He says, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. So first of all, Paul says, imitate God. And then he answers the question. How, how do we do that? Well, we live like Christ. We love like Christ. It's a simple answer, right? Not always easy to live out. Amen? And so if we're going to imitate God, we're going to live like Christ and we're going to love like Christ. Now, I got another statement I want to make, and you've probably heard this before. Have you ever heard this quote, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery? How many of you have heard that before? What does that mean? 
if I begin to act like this person, right, and I imitate them, what I'm doing is I'm paying them the highest of compliments. And so if, if Paul says, let's imitate God, guess what? When we do it, we're paying him the highest of compliments. Now, some of you said your parents when, you said, when I asked you the question who your role model was. I remember my dad, who's going on to be with Jesus, and, but he was, my, he was one of my role models. He was my role model. And the reason he was is because I knew, first of all, that he loved God with all his heart. And he was my hero. Anybody, your dads were your hero. Now, I get it. Some of you in this room, maybe your dads were, were lousy. And it's hard for you to make that connection. But I'm here to tell you, there is a heavenly father that you can look to who's a perfect example. Amen? And how is he a perfect example? Because he perfectly loves you. How many of you believe that? That God perfectly loves you? And so as kids, we look up to our dads. And many of us, we, like my dad, we call him hero. We want to be like him. And so what I would say is I want to declare to you that God is worth imitating. He gives us the insight into how to live and how to imitate God through watching what Jesus did and how he lived. So what I want to do is I want to just talk to you about a few minutes about the love of God. What does is, what is the love of God look like? Well, it looks like a cross, doesn't it? It was sacrificial. He gave his very life for you. We call it agape love. It's not the kind of love that you, re- you watch on TV or see in Hollywood. That's, that's not real love. That's just emotions, and a lot of times it's just nothing but lust, right? But this love that we're talking about, this agape love, sacrifices for someone else, lays down their lives for someone else. Can I get an amen this morning? And so then when I see this, I see that, okay, Christ loved, but he also lived a certain way. How did he live? Well, I want, to, I want to just talk about this for a second. How did Christ live? Well, first of all, he lived in humility. How did he, how did he show humility? Went to the cross. Philippians 2 tells us that he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death on the cross. Isn't that good news this morning? So how did he live? He lived in humility. Number two, how did he live? He lived teachable by learning from his Father. If you read the, the New Testament and you read the Gospels, you'll know that over and over again would Jesus say, I'm only saying what Dad's telling me. Over and over again. I only do what my, my Dad tells me to do. What is he saying? I'm imitating my Dad and so should you. Y'all with me this morning? And so, how did he live? He lived in humility by going to the cross. How did he live? He lived teachable by listening to his dad. Number three, he communicated the gospel well, right? Think about that for a second. He was a brilliant communicator. This guy could take a loaf of bread, or he could take a glass of wine, or he could take any kind of object and make it into a story and and drive an important point home to you just by telling you a story. So he communic- He was the, when it comes to communicators, he's the communicator of all communicators. Amen? And he did it well. And so his message of the cross, his message of forgiveness, his message of freedom is one that penetrates the heart and does a work. Amen? So this is how he lived. He was humble. He was teachable. Those of you that know, who've been around Grow Church, you know where I'm going, right? He communicated the gospel. Here's another one. He spoke the truth in love. I'm reminded of the story. You guys remember the story of the woman caught in the act of adultery? I mean, this is is graphic. I'm telling you, this woman was literally caught in the act and drug out where she was into the public. And they're challenging him to say, we need to stone this lady. And I'm like, where's the guy? They're going to stone this lady for her act of adultery. And he says, okay, yeah, do it. But y'all, you guys here that are, that are free of sin, y'all go ahead and throw the stone. And boy, those, you can hear, thum, 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 thum. and it's just him and her. And he says, where are your accusers? I don't have any. Neither do I condemn you. But watch what he says. 
He does not let her off the hook, folks. Go and sin no more. In other words, I love you. I'm so glad. I am so glad that I get a chance to transform your life. But you got a responsibility. Get up from there and don't do it again. What did he do? He spoke the truth in love to her. And I guarantee you it transformed her from the inside out. We don't have a record of what happened afterward, but I, I know how Jesus, remember what I said a few weeks ago? One moment in the presence of Jesus can change everything. He fulfilled his call. How did he do that? Well, he went around and was developing relationships. He, was, he, was, he, he loved to have fun. Some of people may not believe this, but I believe that Jesus had fun. How many of you believe that? Well, he, went, he liked to go to parties, right? How many of you like to go to boring parties? I guarantee you where Jesus was, there was some fun going on. Amen. Because he loved life. He walked in his purpose, his call. And he excelled in making disciples. Realize this. Okay, so... He, he comes to earth, and he clothes himself in flesh, and he chooses 12 guys. Not the 12 guys that you would think, okay, send me your resume. I want all the great leaders on my team. That's not what he did. He took a ragtag bunch of guys, tax collectors, fishermen, I mean, kind of all, all kinds of people, and here's what he did. He turned the world upside down to, with 12. And so not only did he have 12 he multiplied it to 70, and then the 70 became 120, and the 120 became 30 million, and the 30 million, now billions of people are following Jesus. I think he excelled in making disciples, don't you? How did he live? Humbly, teachable, loving, excellent, fun. And he was excellent in what he did. Amen? So how did, he, how did he love? We already said that. He loved sacrificially. He gave his very life. And here's the thing. He was not just passive about it, Denise. No. He was proactive. And he said, look, they're, they're in desperate shape. There's a group of people down there that I created. They're, they're struggling. They're flailing around. I need to do something about it. Let me clothe myself in flesh. Let me walk as they walked and understand the temptations that they understood and, and die on the cross and walk out of the tomb, folks. That's love. So how did he live? We've, we've already said that. How did he love? He loved sacrificially. He gave his very life. And he was so proactive about it. So if we sum that part up, when we love, live and love like Jesus, we're imitating God. Amen. Number two, let's live and love like Christ instead of indulging in self. This is countercultural. Is it not, folks? But I'm here to tell you, in case you haven't realized it, Christianity is, is countercultural. By nature, it's countercultural. Instead of loving ourselves and trying to, to, to focus on us, we're supposed to focus on other people. We're supposed to serve. All, all those things we've talked about so far. And so let's read together. I want us to continue reading. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Who's he talking to here? He's not talking to sinners. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the church. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person, watch this, is a what? An idolater worshiping the things of the world. And so here's what, I, as I read that, I began to think about that. You are, okay, let's say this. Whatever your affection is, that's what you worship. Wherever your affection is, that's the thing you worship. So in this case, he talks about greed. If you're greedy, what does the word greed mean? What, do you, what does it mean when you're greedy? Well, you love stuff more than you love God. Your affection is on money and things instead of God. That's what we, we define as greed. And anything, watch this, anything 
that steals our affection away from God is an idol, folks. Anything. And so he says, an idolater, a person who's greedy, is basically worshiping that thing. It has our affection. And so I ask you the question, what or who has your affection? So you can't, you can't have a, that ultimate affection. You can't worship two things, right? What did Jesus say? Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. He says, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So who has your affection? Because what you... What has your affection is what you worship. So what's the remedy for all this? This stuff that we've been, some of these behaviors we read, and, and even this idea of, of where to place our affection. Well, it starts back with that one word. It starts with love. What did Jesus say? Love the Lord your God with some of your heart. Hmm. He said all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. In other words, you have to be all in. It's not halfway loving God. And then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. And so what's the remedy for these issues, these affections being misplaced? It's just love, simply falling in love with Jesus. We make it so complicated, don't we? But all he's saying is, fall in love with me. Make me your affection. Make me the thing that you desire and you pursue more, the most. Amen. Remember, I like to say this, God is not a fuddy-duddy. Anybody know what that word means? Anybody ever heard the word? Basically, all it means is, you know, a spool sport or stuffy. Doesn't like to have any fun, right? God is not a fuddy-duddy. In other words, when he tells you not to do something, he's not trying to ruin your parade. Amen? And think in terms of a parent. How many of you are parents in here? If you had your kid... And you let them just wander around on, on, in East Cherokee as a three-year-old. Is that smart parenting? Why? Because little Johnny is going to get hit by a car. And we know what the rest of that story, how that goes. Why do you tell little Johnny not, go, not to go play in the, in the road? Because you know little Johnny, you're keeping little Johnny from being hurt. So think about this in terms of boundaries. We need boundaries. And all, it is, all these things are that God's saying is, let me set some boundaries. As a good father, let me set some boundaries for you. Why? Not because he wants to be a fuddy-duddy and ruin your fun. No, he knows the destruction and, the, and what ha will happen if you go outside the boundaries. And some of us have been there. We know how destructive it is, right? And let me also remind you that what the enemy wants to do to you, what does he want to do? Steal, kill, destroy. So what's he going to do? He's going to, he didn't make you do stuff, right? You can't use the excuse, well, the devil made me do it. No, no. But he does attract. He does allure, right? He does tempt you. And so when God says, don't do this, don't do that, you can rest assured his heart for you is not to harm you, not to be a fuddy-duddy, to ruin your fun. No, he has your best interest in mind. He's your dad. Being a parent's not always fun, is it? The other thing that he need, you need to understand is that he, don't, he, won't, he doesn't want you be, being robbed of the joy of a relationship with him. He wants fellowship with you. He pursued you. And so when he says, don't do this, don't do that, all he wants to do is he wants to make sure that this, this relationship continues that flow of, there's a flow of, of relationship, there's communication. And we know that a lot of times sin can block that communication. It can block that flow, right? And so remember this, that God wants for you a life beyond your, own, your imagination. That's why heaven's going to be so great, folks, right? So whatever you can think of, however you picture heaven, how great it might be, or great it's going to be, and multiply that times, I don't know, an infinite number. 
Because it's going to blow your mind what he has for you. And so we have to remember, this is God's heart for us. Not to ruin our lives, but as a parent, he wants, God's, he wants his best for you. So he begins to declare to us that really this is all a matter of the heart, right? And here's how Jesus described it in Matthew 15, 19. He said, from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. So this becomes a heart issue, doesn't it? What is the heart, when you see a heart, what do you think of? Say it. Love. That's why on Valentine's Day, guys, you go to, down to the Walgreens and you buy one of those uh, mixed candy hearts that has the uh, chocolates that taste like toothpaste. <laughs> so you, you give them the symbol of love, right? And so Jesus is getting to the point here, the symbol of your love and affection is your heart. And so if, you, if, I gotta, if we're going to change the, the trajectory, if we're going to change the way you behave, we've got to get to the heart of the issue. We've got to get to the root of it. Amen? And so he's identifying these things. These things come from your heart, and there's gotta, something's got to change. Because the heart is the source of love and affection. And apart from Christ, it leads down a wrong road. Here's how Jeremiah said it, because here's, here it is. our hearts are prone to wonder. Would you agree? Here's how he says it in, in uh, Jeremiah 17, 9. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Well, that doesn't sound very good, is it? Does it? And some of us, you've heard somebody say, well, you just trust your heart. No. Don't trust your heart. According to Jeremiah, don't trust it. It'll deceive you. It'll lead you around, down a wrong path. No, who do you trust? You trust him. And what are you doing? You put your affection, your heart, toward God. And what happens, there's a transformation that happens as you do that. I hope this is helping somebody today. And so, that's why it's so important for us to get to the heart of these issues. Allow the Holy Spirit to do a work in your heart so that you can start behaving differently. You can never, listen folks, I know I've done it before. I've tried to willpower stuff. Anybody ever tried to willpower? How far did that get you? It don't work. But a life surrendered to the Holy Spirit can be transformed and can be renewed. And I'm telling you folks, You'll see, you'll watch it in amazement, the behavior change. That should have got an amen. So what is it that changes you? It's the gospel of Christ. It's the fact that Jesus came and died on the cross. That's what changes you. Placing your faith, placing your affection on the Lord Jesus Christ will change you forever. Now, let me say this. The moment that you... Place your faith in Christ's finished work on the cross. The Bible says that you're justified. Anybody know what that word means? It means just as if you'd never sinned at all. How is that possible? It's because Christ has clothed you in his righteousness. And now when God looks at you, he doesn't see you. He sees the righteousness of Christ. He sees perfection. But something else has to change. Remember, you have a soul. Right? You have a mind, you have a will, and you have emotions that need to be changed because all the behaviors, all the things that you watched, all the things that you listened to, all the behaviors that you engaged in before Christ, something has to be unlearned and then something has to take its place. You know what we call that? We call it sanctification. That, my friends, is a process. It didn't happen overnight, but it's necessary. Amen. And so what he's calling us to is surrendering to the Holy Spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit to sanctify us, to change us. And when we pretty soon, when we, when we begin to let him do that, we, we notice that our, we, our thinking changes. We, we think differently. Our perspective on life changes. And man, I never knew life could be like this. This is what Christ offers you today. And you'll notice that all the sins that Paul noted here in Ephesians 5. 
sex. Ooh, he said the S word. Money, humor, are all of those, are those three bad? Sex, is it bad? Money, bad? Fun and humor? In the right context. Right? Let's take sex for instance. Sex inside of the marriage covenant between a man and a woman, it's actually God ordained. It's beautiful. I know some of you are like, why is he talking about this? Because you need to know. You need to know that sex is something that God created. Who messed it up? The enemy. The enemy counterfeits and perverts everything that God creates. And so inside the marriage covenant, inside a context, sex is beautiful. Outside, destruction and regret and all kinds of stuff. Y'all follow me? Money. Let's take money, for instance. Anybody got a dollar or, or some kind of bill? Real quick. I should have had one. I, here. I will give it back to you, I promise. <laughs> so this, these dollar bills, are they evil or good? They're immoral. They're not good or bad. In my hands, good or bad. So these same dollars that I have, I can take it and I can go feed a homeless person. Or I can go buy drugs. What's the difference? The heart. What has my affection? Are you following me? Inside the right context, money's good. Money does a lot of good. There have been a lot of people won to the Lord because money's been given in a church. There have been missionaries who've been able to stay on the field because of this. Thank you. Y'all with me? That's why I I will so important. Because there's a vision and a mission God's called us to do. And and God's saying, let me resource what what I've put in your heart to do. To win lost people. To disciple people. Let me put that in your heart to do. And here's how we're going to do it. We're going to lock arms together as the body of Christ and make it happen. Inside the context, we've already discovered, inside the right context, sex is great. Inside the right, inside the right context, money's great. What about humor? Inside the right context, it's great. Here's what the book of Proverbs says. Laughter does good like a medicine. Does God want you laughing? You know what laughter does? It tells me that you're enjoying life. Did I mention that God doesn't want to be a fuddy-duddy? you see how destructive these things are when we don't follow dad's instructions when we play in the street when we shouldn't come on y'all follow me this is what it's, this is all about folks and so if we'll just turn our attention and our heart to the right things and understand that God has your best interest in mind things work first John chapter 4 watch this we know how much God loves us. How many of you know how much God loves you? And we have put our trust in his love. God is love, and all who live in love live in God. Wow, that's good news, huh? And God lives in them. What's the greatest indicator that you're a follower of Jesus? The love you have for God. And the love you have for people. Where's your affection today? Who or what has it? I'm going to keep asking that question because I want, you to, I want that to go deep. And you notice what it says. It doesn't say God does love or acts like love. No, it says he is love. In other words, it's his character. He cannot not love. Does that make sense? I know that's, that sounds weird, but he cannot not love because he's perfectly love. Now watch what he says. And as we live in God... What happens to our love? Our love grows more perfect. Why? Because we're living in God, and God is perfectly love. Now follow me. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. Well, we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. So how do we imitate Daddy, God? We live... And we love 
like Christ. And as we do that, more of his love impacts us. And our, you, you, you'll watch it. Our affection for those things that we used to want, the things that we used to desire, oh, I don't really want that anymore. Can anybody identify? Now my affection. Now all my love. I want to pour out on the one who poured out his love for me. So we live in him so, we can, so he can live in us. And we can live like him. So I want to ask you a couple questions. You know that God loves you. We just declared it. So, do we really love and trust Him enough? Do we really, do we really believe He has good plans for us? Now, I see a lot of people shaking their heads, and that's great. But sometimes we say stuff. But the behavior doesn't line up. Yeah, I trust God. Yeah, I love God. But then our behavior says, it, it tells on you. Folks, your behavior tells on you, right? And so if he's really impacting your life and really changing you from the inside, people are going to notice. Here's point three. Living in Christ produces the light of Christ in us. Let's keep reading. Verse 15. Or, I'm sorry, verse 6. Excuse me. I got ahead, didn't I? Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey Him. Don't participate in the things these people do. Watch verse 8. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. He's identifying the difference that happens when you turn your affection off of those things and on to God, right? There's going to be a change. And what happens is the light of God. For this light within you produces, watch here, here's some fruit, right? What does it produce? Only what is good and right and true. All three. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that the ungodly people do in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So here's, here's what I want to say there. Because when we, when we come into relationship with Christ, there's a light that shined on our heart, right? What does light do? It, just, it reveals stuff, right? So the light shining on your life shows some things. And God says, hey, that right there, let's take care of that. So when the light of his truth, when the light of the, the word of God shines on your life and you're made aware of some things that need to change, it's your responsibility to step into those changes. And here's what happens. The light of life in your, in your heart, what does it produce? Good, right. And true. That's a pretty good outcome, right? And you notice he says expose the things that even are. In other words, he's not asking you to go around and drag people out of parties and stuff like that and, and make a fool out of them. No, what he's saying is, why don't you start influencing? Why don't you start being a light to people? That just your very presence in somebody's life, ooh, ooh, what's different about you? Y'all follow me. And when the light of Christ shines in your heart, y'all smell that? That garlic just hit me. Sorry about that. I just, uh, whoa. Okay, we're done. The light of God, the light of Christ shining in your heart, exposing things in you, you get them right, and then you become the light. And that's what Jesus said. Go be salt and light, didn't he? Not only does it expose things, but it dispels darkness. In other words, if you're in Christ, and the light of Christ is shining in your life, wherever you go, darkness flees. Come on, somebody. 
You should be that influential in the places that you go, the place that you work, your family, your neighborhood. There should be so much light coming out of you that you dispel darkness all over the place. That's what God's called us to do. When you live in light, change starts to happen. That's why it's so important for us to to understand that it's not just one person, John. It's the body of Christ as a whole. What if the body of Christ owned that responsibility of being salt and light everywhere we go? Christianity, man, boom, 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 boom. All over the world, people getting saved. So let's live in that light. Last thing before we, before, before we close. Let's keep reading. We're going to read it. Verse 15. So be careful uh, now how you live. Don't live like fools. Watch what he says. But like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. In other words, find out why you're here and walk in it. Now notice what he says here. Don't be drunk with wine. Because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what is he saying here at the very end? Here's what he's saying. I believe that as you're stewarding your purpose well, while you're here, that's a big part of you living and loving like Christ. Does that, does that make sense? And so when I, when I see this, I see he says, be careful how you live. In other words, examine. Examine your daily routines. I'm, I'm going to make this real practical. Examine your daily routines. What do you do day in and day out? Is it significant? Is what you do on a daily basis, is it making a difference? I don't know, Pastor. Pastor. And then he says, walk as people that are wise. What do wise people do? How do do wise people act? Let me ask that. That's a good question. How do they act? They make good choices, right? They make real good decisions. And so if Christ is is the central focus of your life, if he is your affection, here's what Colossians says, in Christ are found all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so if you want to know how to live your life every day, seek Him. So simple. And then Paul is saying, don't waste a moment of your life. Don't waste it on things that don't matter. Don't waste it in all those behaviors we just described. Instead, walk wisely. Find your purpose. And don't just find it, but walk in it. And then, we've, we've said this already before. Notice who keeps coming up in the, these passages. Paul keeps talking about the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he's the one who's playing this crucial role in your, in your change. Amen? That's why Jesus said, I'm leaving, he's coming, be filled. And Paul reiterates it. Be filled with the Spirit. In other words, look. If you take the first part of that verse, it says, don't be drunk with wine. Why does he say don't be drunk with wine? Because anything that has influence over your life, instead of Christ, can lead to destruction. I've never been drunk before, praise God. And some of you may have, and I'm not, we're not pointing fingers. Not, but we've, we've all seen how people who are drunk act. How many of you have seen a drunk person? Or been, well, I'm not going to say I've been drunk too. <laughs> how many of you have seen a drunk person before? I know everybody's going to raise your hand. How do they act? They, they act totally stupid. And that, yeah, not wisdom, that's for sure. And listen, they will do things that they regret. So, listen, listen to me, folks. Sometimes they do things they can regret for the rest of their life. It, one moment, one bad decision, drunk, can cause you, your, the trajectory of your life to change. So what's Paul saying? Don't let that influence you. 
Don't be under the influence of the things that would turn your affection away from Christ. No, be filled with the Spirit because here's what He's going to do. He's going to point your affection to Christ. Let Him be the influencer in your life. If you're going to be under the influence of anything, be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And then lastly, I love this part because I, I believe this all comes back to worship. Right? What I say first, whatever has our affection is what we worship, right? Notice how he ends it. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to the Lord, right? So, again, worship's not just singing songs, right? But he is making a point of whatever you worship, that's where your affection is. And so when we come in here, Lord, I love you. How great thou art. I'm singing and I'm expressing my affection and my love to God by my songs, by my hymns, by my spiritual songs. And here's what's going to happen. The, the, the Lord, His Spirit changes me from the inside out. So, it's really important that you discover where your affection is. And that may be hard for some of us. Because it's going to cause us to have to be truthful with where we are right now. As we're closing, i got three questions I want to ask you. Number one, how can you live and love like Christ in this world? Number two, how can you be a light in dark places? And number three, what can you do starting today to steward your purpose well? If you stand this morning. Thank you for tuning in to our online broadcast here at Grow Church. We hope that you've heard something today that will strengthen and encourage you throughout the week. Make sure you tune in next week for our next broadcast. God bless.